Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and I am here for another exciting 6.5 Live video cast slash television with my famous co-host, Daniel Newman. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. Almost famous is probably a better uh, descriptor, but uh, we'll take our 15 or 30 minutes of fame here on the 6.5 Live podcast edition. And by the way, it's been a lot of fun over the last couple of months taking this thing live streaming it out, getting it out in real time to people, you know, it changes the dynamic a little bit of the show uh, because, you know, you have to be cognizant that people are watching in real time. There's no editing. Yeah. Uh, you can't fix things you say. So you got to be a little more careful maybe about, uh, uh, you know, how you, how you say things or what you say, and especially because we really are analyzing things that oftentimes, Pat, are coming out almost in, in real time. But, but I hope everyone out there has been enjoying it. I'm happy to be here. It's a Friday. Um, you know, only a 12, 13 hour work day, much less than the last few. Um, and I'm excited to talk because it's been a big week in tech. Yeah, let's dive in here. So uh, we have a, a bunch of stuff we're going to be talking about here. Uh, and why don't we jump right in? But as a reminder, uh, we are going to talk about public companies. Uh, please don't use this as any investment advice. Uh, this is for information and education and entertainment purposes only. And also, if you're not familiar, uh, we typically hit uh, six, six topics, five minutes each, and it's no news, all analysis, just enough of the news to get our point across. So why don't we jump right in with uh, AWS reInvent? So first off, there were so many announcements. There's not, there's no chance uh, that we're going to be able to hit all of the core ones today. But what I thought uh, I'd like to do is really drill on, in on the EC2 announcements. And as you know, EC2 is all about compute. And uh, if nothing else, uh, what I appreciate about uh, the folks at EC2 is their ability to position. Uh, and, and as you know, my background, I, I, like Daniel and I, used to have real jobs before we became analysts. Uh, and I used to run uh, product uh, strategy and, and marketing. And this is basically EC2. Uh, most, largest, fastest, highest, lowest cost, best per price performance only. Uh, I like this, and that that may sound architecture, but it clearly talks about uh, what is important to them and how they, if nothing else, uh, view them. So, uh, a couple of the key announcements that I'd like to hit uh, about about EC2 is um, first off, um, Trainium. So, Trainium is uh, AWS's homegrown machine learning and deep learning uh, training solution. Uh, right now, and as Daniel and I have talked about a ton, literally the only vendor who's been able to get traction with mach accelerated machine learning training has been uh, NVIDIA. But the promise that Trainium is making here is that uh, it will be um, the most teraflops compute power other than any other machine learning instance in the cloud. And that includes, it would have to be uh, the NVIDIA uh, V100. I use the same Neuron SDK, uh, supports TensorFlow, MXNet, and, and PyTorch, and it will be available through SageMaker. Now, this was just an announcement and not an instance. And, and you know, there's also not as much information as you may want out there to be able to compare this to the NVIDIA uh, V100. But this isn't, I don't think this is AWS hiding anything. I, I think this is them just doing what they normally do. They announced the chip with a few broad claims, and then they announced the instance uh, with more people and uh, uh, cu beta customers uh, with, with more specs. But I think this was the biggest uh, uh, EC2 uh, announcement of the day. Yeah, that was a, that was a big one, Pat. Um, you know, of course, having had a chance to speak behind the scenes to some of the leadership on Trainium and on a, uh, AWS, you know, they also recently released uh, P4D, which was built on Ampere's uh, A100 architecture for uh, another accelerated workload. What I really got was this, Pat. If you kind of followed Andy Jass's keynote, he waved the wand of the company uh, really trying to push the envelope on training and AI workloads in the cloud period. Now, again, up to about a year ago, if you really talked to a lot of IT leaders and even consultants and you suggested the idea of training and acceleration in the in the cloud, you'd get that 
the, 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 the spinning jackpot, you know, it's too expensive. Yeah. Too much data, it's too expensive to put it there, too expensive to accelerate it. And so these companies were putting this out and on small training uh, cases, it was achievable. But what really is happening now is they're trying to democratize that. And so AWS really has that promise. They're looking at two different um, really levers. The first is the economics, Pat. So it's the economics of um, how do we do more data uh, and train it faster is the second piece of the pie. So what I liked was Andy's approach. He, he launched Gaudi and, you know, uh, Habana with in, in Intel. He, he announced Trainium. They've got all the instances. You mentioned V100. you got P4D and A100 instances. I think AWS is really trying to be, uh, and what I really got out of this is choice. Not just in AI, though, by the way, Pat, but just in the whole thing, whether it was their various EC2 compute instances, memory intensive, storage intensive, they're doing it with their chips, they're doing it with Intel chips, they're doing things with AMD chips. I actually really like the fact that AWS is kind of saying, look, we meet the customer where they are. Some people may look at it and say they're trying to take everybody on. I kind of look at it and they're saying, we want to give options to customers. We want the customers to be able to get the type of compute required uh, for their, their different workloads. And we'll meet them where they are and we'll let them do it in the cloud. And now, by the way, Pat, they're also getting more and more focused on letting customers do it in hybrid environments and on-prem. So I thought it was a, I thought it was a very encouraging set of announcements from Andy. Yeah, so um, just for those who might not be familiar with Habana out there, that was a Habana, Habana. Uh, I'm not too sure how to say that, but Habana, this was an acquisition that Intel made uh, uh, to get into the training market. Uh, the prior investment they had made, which was Nirvana, didn't work out uh, as, as they wanted. And my guess now is that Intel saw the traction that Habana, Habana was getting inside of AWS and bought the company. Uh, the big claim that they're making is that up to 40% better price performance relative to GPU-based EC2 instances. Uh, so it's not a necessarily a performance play, a performance leadership play, let's say, versus the NVIDIA V100, but more of a price performance uh, play. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Habana is that it can do inference and training, but it looks like the company is is going to stick to uh, training wor workloads first and foremost. Makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly if you have, uh, let's say, an INF1 instance uh, next to it or um, uh, a T4, G4 type uh, instance to do uh, the fastest uh, inference out there. Uh, speaking of outposts, uh, one of the other bigger um, announcements that was made was uh, a single uh, server SKU in a, in a 1U form factor, and that has Graviton 2 in it. So what that means is a, a much lower entry price for outposts and a much smaller form factor. And what wasn't uh, trumpeted uh, necessarily on the keynote is that these are, uh, uh, you get these with ARM-based uh, Graviton 2 uh, uh, inside. So think less about a, a regional data center. Think more of this being in a fast food restaurant uh, attached to the wall or a gas station uh, underneath uh, the desk. And it was one of the key objections that I know that customers had uh, about outposts, right? Uh, and, and I see this as them knocking uh, another one out. So you can get full racks, you can get a 1U, you can get 2U uh, in there. And with most, not all of AWS's uh, services and uh, uh, compute uh, uh, capabilities. And the, uh, the other one, the other EC2 announcement that really caught my eye uh, was the um, one with AMD, with Radeon Pro and Epic processors, uh, the EC2 G4 AD. Now, first off, I had never heard of a Radeon Pro uh, V520. And I was, as I was getting pre-briefed, I was anxiously uh, uh, doing a Google search on it. Subsequently, um, I was told that it's a, a custom card uh, that is for AWS, uh, eight gigs, uh, high speed, high speed memory, um, some tricks they're doing with, uh, with PCIe that's attached to the second gen AMD Epic processor. My guess is, is they're, they're going to go PCIe four for the highest performance. This is essentially for, think of this as workstation in the cloud. Okay. 
uh, they're not uh, necessarily rolling out the virtualization capability, but it, it's more of a one-to-one -one than, let's say, a, a one-to-many virtualized uh, environment. Think about Amazon Workspaces as an example. You want to run your workstation app. You want to do game streaming or uh, generalized graphics rendering. But, Daniel, to your very intelligent um, macro point here, this is about choice. And one thing I think Amazon's doing really well is I don't think they're pissing off the, they're, they're not throwing their own silicon in the face of their partners. They're taking a very scientific approach to this. If they want the highest performance, they'll put something in there that's, that's the highest performance. If it's NVIDIA, boom. Uh, if it's AMD, boom. If it's their own stuff, boom. Now those probably come in 18 month increments or 12 month increments, but uh, and then they have their lowest cost uh, uh, way they choose silicon. Again, their own silicon, other people's silicon, uh, it doesn't matter. And the secret sauce underneath this, and, and you and I have both written about this, is the nitro layer, right? And listen, offloading uh, doesn't necessarily have the sex appeal that a giant training chip dove does, but over the past six years... Uh, AWS has built a layer that has disaggregated compute from storage, uh, security, and even virtualization. And what that enables you to do, it enables you to much more quickly move in different flavors and brands of compute because typically security, management, virtualization, and networking offload uh, is inextricably linked uh, to, to, to that processor. So uh, some people say IaaS is commoditized. And, and as I learned from one of my, uh, biggest, uh, tutors or mentors when I was in my twenties is that he said, Patrick, uh, things don't just get commoditized. People allow things to get commoditized. And, I believe that through my, uh, throughout my entire career. And what AWS is doing is, is they are decommoditizing IaaS, okay, through vertical uh, integration uh, and choice. Yeah, so obviously for everyone out there listening, 6.5, we're doing a double segment on reInvent. There was 300 plus announcements, <laughs> so just so you understand, it'll kind of be the five plus five, five, five today, just because uh, we got to do this a little bit differently. Um, which is why we're still on this. But second, it's worth being on because there is so much happening here. Pat, you made a great point about disaggregation. Um, it is a really big part of the overall strategy of AWS, has more to do with choice. Andy's said for years about meeting customers where they are. I think for a few years, one of the er uh, areas that Andy had been somewhat reticent and the whole AWS business had been somewhat reticent to meet the customer has been hybrid and multi-cloud. You're starting to see some... Um, kind of backing off there as well, because there's more and more opening uh, up to the idea of true hybrid, which isn't even just outposts, but truly that workloads could exist on-prem, workloads could exist in other clouds, and AWS is building um, you know, more and more support for, for that. A um, couple other things, Pat, just quickly, because you, know, you really covered the EC2 stuff well. Um, there's a couple of things that caught my attention that maybe worth worth mentioning. One is the, the advancements with containers, the ECS and EKS everywhere, great example, right? Before it was containers in AWS, uh, running AWS, the whole migration in this particular show really focused on containers being uh, managed, deployed, developed anywhere for both on-prem and for AWS using AWS's tool set, which I think is gonna make uh, developers and AWS uh, infrastructure users very happy. Um, a couple other things, by the way, and on top of that, what was called AWS Proton, which is going to be basically your full stack management for automation and serverless. The one thing I've learned, Pat, um, talking to many enterprises working with containers has been, it's not about doing a container that's hard. It's about having 15,000 enterprise applications and microservices, and you're trying to do this at scale. So this automation layer with Proton is going to be really important. Another thing, um, just two little observations, because I could talk about this forever, but one was what they're doing with database, Pat, very interesting, okay? The whole database, the Babelfish, um, 
you know, SQL serverless, the ability for people to basically migrate SQL licenses, SQL licenses to AWS, um, Aurora with Babelfish um, is going to be a very interesting competition discussion going forward. Uh, Andy and the team at AWS is really looking to make this transition easy and as the economics um, of not having all the licensing costs could get very interesting and start to create a lot wow. of competition there. Go ahead. Well, it's pretty cool to put your uh, Microsoft SQL apps right on top of of a MySQL from Amazon is is pretty cool, <laughs> right? It cool. Uh, and it's also got a big economic thing that's going to bring some debate and it's going to push some innovation from Azure. They're going to have to make some innovation and make some decisions on how they want to respond uh, to this particular uh, development. And one other thing too, just worth mentioning, because I talked about Proton and containers and I talked about Babelfish is um, there's a bit of a juggernaut within AWS for software. Um, what they're doing with Connect uh, for you know for everything from voice and video to contact center, it's really deep. And by the way, if you didn't know, companies like Slack and Salesforce are actually using some of this stuff um, in the back end of, of their offerings. But you know, it's almost like it's a sleeping giant here. Also, a bunch of business intelligence apps, Pat, where they're doing um, ML and enrichment of data and offering real-time dashboards of intelligence for everything from supply chain and operations to financials. I mean, quietly, AWS is starting to really uh, enter that stack of the SaaS side where it's not going to be so quiet for much longer. Yeah, that's right. And and we'll be able to hit on these in future shows. I think next show we, we should do a drill down. But here's the way I look at it. Uh, AWS looks at its opportunities and uh, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, and uh, it gets itself ready. If it doesn't have an IaaS customer for a certain application, they're going to build the application themselves, right? Um, like Contact Center, I think, is a great opportunity. I don't think that the majority of the cloud contact centers are using AWS and therefore AWS is gonna build uh, their own and kind of ready to, to go in and pounce. Uh, uh, Zoom does most of its IaaS on AWS, but in the wings, you've got Chime, <laughs> right? That, that, that let's say, you know, uh, Zoom got ornery um, a, a, AWS could come in and, and make that a full blown market it more than they do uh, today. But we have talked, like you said, 300 <laughs> yeah. announcements. We got, yeah, we got the next going. trip. We have got to move on, uh, to our next topic, which was the Qualcomm Snapdragon summit and the Snapdragon eight, eight, eight. What is this voodoo, Daniel? Oh, Pat. Um, Wow. And by the way, thank you uh, for allowing us to have both of these events the same week. Now, I will say this is a tamed down Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit. I think the company recognized doing it remote. Um, and when I say tamed down, one huge announcement, but in the past, it's been many, many, many announcements. Um, you know, for, for uh, Qualcomm, which basically is the leading platform in the world for developing the SOCs for um, your mobile devices, um, their next generation was, you know, due to come out. And this was the moment last year, Pat, we were in Hawaii this year, we are in our houses. Um, but you know, it was a really, uh, exciting announcement because what 888 represents, and by the way, for anyone who doesn't know the eight series Qualcomm Snapdragon has always represented what they call the flagship, the top of the line, um, with 5G, with next generation technology, what Qualcomm really did here was said, we're going all in on eight. Um, my guess, Pat, this will be the last eight series. There will be a not, something's going to come next. What do you do now? What do you do after this? 889 is not very interesting. 888 squared, but the 888 is the ultimate. And just a couple of the little highlights. Um, third generation X65 G um, modem and RF system. This RF modem system is the bees knees and it is what has made Qualcomm win in this place. It, it's been unrepeatable. Other companies have tried and failed. Nobody's been able to quite do this modem RF system at the level of Qualcomm, which has enabled them to win um, designs in almost every, uh, with every major OEM in the world. Um, sixth generation AI engine. Nobody thinks of Qualcomm as an AI company, but the company is doing a lot of things with, especially on device. Uh, with AI and it's a uh, re-engineered um, Qualcomm Hexagon processor. Um, it has a second generation sensing hub 
which is going to enable a lower power, always on AI processing. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, of what are some other things. Um, a number of adaptive features uh, for IoT, for XR, for gaming. Uh, and by the way, Pat, cameras, the, the next generation image sensor, I think it's got three image sensing image sensor processors on it, which is gonna be the first of its type, um, faster by 35%. I know, I mean, I'm kind of reporting it here, Pat, but the thing is, this thing is loaded to the gills. And like uh, the in fashion of Qualcomm, um, early indicators are all the OEMs will continue to work with Qualcomm. So you're talking about the Samsungs, you're talking about the Xiaomi's, you're talking about, um, help me out here, Pat, what are the others? Uh, you know, Samsung. And, and everything that's not Apple. And by the way, Apple <laughs> is using some of Qualcomm. There is a partnership around 5G, but the Snapdragon is basically powering all the high profile devices. And, and by the way, down market in their seven and six series, Qualcomm is now enabling 5G and much more mid-tier and lower tier. But this 888 was a big moment, big inflection point. And by the way, one of the most profound moments of the event was when Cristiano Amon, uh, the president of Qualcomm's technology business, said, we are a camera company. And I know that sounds sort of um, you know, provocative or profound or, or, or even maybe crazy for a company that has a high-powered um, computer in your hands and they're going to take claim as the camera company. But the data's in, Pat. It was like 61% of people buy their phone for what they believe is the highest end camera in the market. Well, look, I use an iPhone. I also use a Samsung um, S20 as well as a Note 20. Um, Apple's camera, I don't know what people think. It's not the best camera on the market. I, I get that people like the camera, but that stovetop, um, when I need a great picture, the Note 20, I take that thing out every single time. I'm just going to leave it there. So what were your thoughts? Yeah, so I really like this event because it gives you a good snapshot of what the super phones of 2020 or, or, or the following year are going to look like, right? You got the Snapdragon Summit, and then you have Mobile World Congress when all the phone makers uh, come out and, and do this. And this essentially is the roadmap for, for all non-Apple handsets out there, which is around 75% uh, are, are non-Apple. Um, Samsung doesn't announce a, at this event, but, you know, guarantee we're going to see the S21 uh, with the 888 inside and really carried on the themes. They've been very consistent, which is I'm going to give you the best connectivity, pretty much every type of 5G you can even think of, uh, adding DSS, uh, global multi-SIM, sub-6 TDD and FTD carrier aggregation, um, sub-6 carrier aggregation. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Um, on the AI, uh, you know, they're claiming 26 tops uh, when you combine all of their AI engines together, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, they talked about it being the highest performance out there. Uh, I'm, I can't wait to see that validated with uh, third-party uh, reviews. A lot of that horsepower, interestingly enough, comes from the DS, a newly designed DSP, uh, in addition to a special neural network processor and what they're leveraging in the GPU. Um, 144 frames a second for, for gaming with, with upgradable drivers, uh, which... As we know, all serious gamers uh, know that that's uh, important. And, and finally, uh, in the geekdom on the camera, uh, a new image signal processor, 2.7 gigabits uh, of um, bandwidth, which essentially means 120 photos simultaneously with 12 megapixel, uh, which is a lot more than I know I can take. Uh, at once, so <laughs> we're going to be thinking. Think of uh, think of multi camera uh, bandwidth is not going to be an issue for this uh, camera system. So, really good stuff. And like you said, I I can't wait to get back to Hawaii. You know, it's interestingly uh, last year I had to take the red eye from Las Vegas to reinvent uh, to Maui to catch Cristiano's uh, opening uh, keynote. I was glad I didn't have to do that. I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I know it was terrible when you landed in Maui and you had to enjoy. I mean, there's something about the air there. You know, this year they sent uh, all of us a little uh, package with some Hawaii themed. I don't know that that made me happy or sad. I, no, I, I know, I know. I love, I love the smell. I like the beads. Thank you. Uh, and but, the tiki, uh, the tiki drink. 
But uh, I mean, after 2020, I mean, that would have been the perfect moment. But this was a big moment and and, and there's a lot more. And I think we'll have to come back and talk yeah. more because the company's got, you know, the HCX and the, the whole line of, uh, you know, rem- of, of compute. It has a XR advancements. It has a number of uh, IoT, edge cloud mm-hmm. AI products, fixed wireless. So there was a lot more going on, but the 888 was the star of the show. So unlike the AWS event where we really are trying to pick a needle in a haystack, among 300 announcements that none were necessarily prioritized <laughs> clearly over the others. This event was all about the next generation of the smartphone pad. And I thought the company did a really good job. And I'm assuming, like you mentioned with Samsung, I'm betting um, that the majority of the uh, high-end smartphones of the next generation are going to be powered by this chip. Yep. So, hey, Daniel, we got to move forward here. Yep. Uh, let's, let's jump into uh, Cloudera earnings. Um, and I'm going to give you the mic on this, but for those who are unfamiliar with uh, Cloudera, they are the data management leaders across on-prem and hybrid. Yeah, the open source, uh, the open source Hadoop era uh, was built by Hortonworks and Cloudera, which are now one big happy family. Pat, we'll get some time back for everybody on this segment. These earnings segments, we can go a little bit quicker, but it was a good quarter. Um, data management and analytics are hot. Open source is hot. Companies are investing, but when I say hot, this isn't uh, you know uh, Zoom 300% hot. This is 12% annual recurring revenue growth kind of hot. Uh, company did about 218 million dollars um, overall solid performance. Uh, company made money, which you know they're still as a publicly traded company, kind of they fluctuate around that uh, few cent gain, few cent loss. Um, but some really good things as their margins, Pat, for non-gap. Um, uh, subscriptions are up. So the company's making more on every dollar they're doing. They made an acquisition this quarter that helps them with their real-time stream processing company called Inventador. That's going to help. Um, and along with a number of products in their in their private cloud, uh, their, so what they call the CDP private cloud. So uh, a few products there has led to this continuous growth. And the company's averaging like a low sing- or high single to low double digit growth each and every quarter. Uh, the street loved this, uh, this uh, particular quarter though, Pat. They were super happy with the results. And a couple of things that I said to keep an eye on. One is they GA'd their Cloudera private cloud offering. This is a big moment for the company. Um, and as it goes GA, it was how are the companies responding? Well, um, 50% of their over 1 million customers, a million dollar a year annual recurring customers, which by the way, they now have 179 up from 172, are now migrating over to Cloudera's uh, CDP private cloud. This is big because is the innovation being adopted? The answer is yes. The company now was able to announce it has over 1,000 customers spending $100,000 on a recurring basis. They're getting more spend. Cloudera is already in almost all the Fortune 200. So the thing that the company really needs is how do they get more wallet from all the Fortune companies? Um, What I'm kind of keeping eye on though, Pat, is how much um, are they able to grab and how much does competition coming from like the big cloud providers, whether that's um, you know, that's Synapse and what Microsoft's doing, whether that's Aurora, Oracle, um, you know, because a lot of big data tools are coming out now in hyperscale cloud are coming from uh, the bigger SaaS based analytics players. And so that's where Cloudera is going to have to compete because it's really been able to compete on economics and on uh, open source. And that is a big thing. Hadoop is a big thing, but it is competitive company. Uh, Bob Beardsley, the CEO, sees an, a bullish outlook. Um, and in fact, Pat, I'll leave you on this, but the company for being a fairly small, you know, sub $1 billion year revenue just approved a $500 million stock buyback, which means the company is very confident that its future is looking bright and that growth is in its cards. That was good. Uh, a good breakdown, Daniel. And uh, the it appears that their overall strategy is working. Uh, and whether it's streaming and data flow, data engineering, data warehouse, operational database, uh, machine learning and AI and connecting all that together uh, with the right level of security, governance, lineage, management, uh, and automation uh, seems to be resounding with their customers. And, and that that is what matters uh, in the end. Uh, listen, big snowflake stock prices are nice, uh, but in the end, it, it is and it always will be uh, about, about the customers. So- <laughs> Yeah, I was just saying one great point I want to leave because I know we got to keep moving, but Snowflake is all that data in the cloud and, and Cloudera, it kind of has that other approach, all that data, you know, prem to cloud. And so that's going to be an interesting uh, uh, just, just a position to watch going forward. 
All right, let's jump into the next big announcement. Uh, we talked about this right at the very end of our last podcast. It was an early break. I think you got a text uh, from a journalist uh, who wanted a comment, but Salesforce officially is uh, acquiring uh, Slack for an eye-popping uh, $37 billion. Uh, uh, the market uh, so far has not received it well because the value of Salesforce has gone down by more than the sales price, which ironically is the exact opposite of what we saw with NVIDIA and ARM, where NVIDIA stock price went up more than their acquisition uh, price. Uh, it's, a, it's a monster um, acquisition. And, and while uh, Salesforce has always competed with Microsoft uh, in our things like CRP, sorry, uh, ERP, CRM, this is the shot across the bow to both Google and Microsoft uh, for personal productivity and more of a, a collaboration approach. And I, I think, you know, I really recognized, uh, listen, more competition is better. I say that, but uh, I, I believe that the street was sour on it for the same reasons that I'm a little bit skeptical on it in that I think it's going to take an incredible amount of increased investment to turn Slack into a relevant competitor to Google and Microsoft. Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't believe that chat is an application or a business. I believe it's a feature. Uh, just like we saw with cloud storage that used to be a business, that's now a feature of all the suites. I really think that that where is that at? And, and I yes, I do understand that Slack, Slack is more than, than that, it's also about automation, right? It's taking that as a base and uh, through low code or no, no code tools, developing apps uh, around that. But at the other side of my mouth, I'll say, I think Salesforce is gonna have to buy uh, a Zoom. Uh, and then what is its answer for personal productivity? I mean, the fact is, we all keep pretending that we don't do Word documents or, or PowerPoints or Excel, uh, but it keeps, uh, that is the tool or those are the tools for businesses today, whether you're a Gen Z, whether you're a millennial or an old Gen Xer like me or my brother who's a boomer. Uh, it's the reason that Apple got out of trying to compete with, with Office uh, 365. So before I turn, turn it over to you, um, I, I like competition. Competition is good. Competition drives innovation. Uh, competition lowers costs. And that's only good for consumers. Uh, I'm skeptical uh, at, at the price uh, and the lack of discussion on the increased investment this is going to take, namely buying a Zoom or creating out of thin air a competitive personal productivity system that is competitive, uh, file competitive with uh, Microsoft. Your take, Daniel. Oh, wow. Um, I'll try to be quick. I've had, I talked about this so much that um, I, I'm, I'm gone. I've lost my hair. Um, <laughs> So 27.7 billion, you're seeing um, acquisition after acquisition doubling in size for the biggest acquisition. So you had about six to seven for MuleSoft, 14 for Tableau, 27.7 for Slack, a uh, huge. I think the street definitely felt that price was too steep for a sub $1 billion uh, run rate company that is struggling to grow. Now, Slack was growing 50% all year uh, on average or so the last couple quarters while Zoom was going 350%. I do wanna, you know, uncontentiously say, Pat, I think there is a 0% chance Salesforce acquires Zoom. It's, it's too expensive. I don't, I think, I'm not even sure which would cost more if Microsoft bought Salesforce or if Salesforce tried to buy Zoom. I mean, I'm just saying that's how expensive Zoom is right now. Uh, Zoom is taking over the world. But I do agree with you right now, they're going to depend on something like Amazon Connect and video features from a third party, which is kind of defeats the purposes of why keep buying companies if you're just going to keep integrating technologies, right? If you're going to integrate other people, then just do that. Um, from a, you know, what Benioff needs to do and wants to do, I believe, is own the productivity experience. 
Um, where do you go when you first turn on the machine? I've said this a lot about different tools. You need to want to start there. That's why Office 365 and Teams have been so successful in growing 100 million daily users this year. You're in Office, you're in you're an email. Oh, let's go over and have a meet. Let's have a chat. It's very it's very fluid to the way someone a productivity worker works. Uh, Google has done the same thing with Workspace, albeit at a smaller volume thus far, but it's become more and more compelling. And in fact, um, a lot of people really prefer it. The thing about Slack is uh, from a chat standpoint, a lot of people did prefer it, but it just missed on everything else. It just didn't have everything else. So Salesforce did acquire a company called Quip for a billion dollars, and it does offer um, some of this productivity uh, toolbox that you're, you're going to need. But yeah, Pat, I think they're going to have to buy up the rest of the suite and make it really, really a, 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 an easy to uh, adopt experience. Now, everybody um, can push back, but I do think Benioff's a smart marketer. I do think he thought this through. Um, I believe that deep down, he thinks he can move the, the needle. So I look at two growth metrics here, and I'll kind of leave it on this growth metric. One is can Salesforce help grow Slack faster than it was growing on its own? You'll start to get a return there, and I do believe that's possible. Second question is, can it grow it as fast as Microsoft? And that's going to be almost impossible. But deep down, when you've built a company like Salesforce, you believe you can. And so the next two, three, four quarters after the acquisition will be very fun to watch. Yeah, my final uh, shot here is, you know, even Google gave up on uh, trying to define their own file formats. And now you can work on Word, PowerPoint and Excel right inside of Google Google Workspaces. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how, how this pan, uh, how, how this how this pans out. So let's move on to our final topic here. And this is uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, announced their uh, earnings for the quarter. And they are back to pre-pandemic growth. And they announced a major move from Silicon Valley to Houston, Texas. What did you think, Daniel? Well, I, I think the big win for this quarter for HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, was returning year over year to a flat to slight growth. I mean, look, the OEMs as a whole have not had shining quarters. While a lot of tech has, a lot of people have been uh, wooing Microsoft, wooing Amazon, Zoom. Um, if you have been, if you're IBM, if you're Cisco, if you're Dell, if you're uh, HPE, this year has been tough. Supply chains have been battered on premises. Deployments have been stunted completely. People aren't going to the office. And a lot of revenue for these big OEMs was on-prem. So yes, there was a cloud component and that has definitely pushed these companies through, but HPE was hit pretty hard. So last quarter, at the end of the quarter, I basically said, can HPE return to growth? Um, can it get back to flat, back to growth? That was sort of the trend we saw with Cisco. That was the trend we saw with Dell most recently. And it looks like the industry as a whole is now back on par. Um, in terms of where did the performance come from? came in a couple of areas, you know, primarily the intelligent edge and the high performance compute business with Cray. Um, those were really where its strength was. It also saw a little bit of a track back getting closer to return to growth with some of its big business units, which would be, you know, its storage, compute, network. Um, those businesses, you know, are still down, but it's down single digits and it's showing um, a bit of a comeback. You know, where I've been watching, Pat, overall uh, has been GreenLake. That's the whole story for Antonio Neri, CEO, is uh, is GreenLake. So where did that go? Well, um, the company sequentially saw about 11% growth in its recurring revenue business overall, hit $585 million and is up 30% year over year. Um, this is the number to watch. The company is deploying service after service after service on GreenLake. That's storage and compute on GreenLake. That's going to be Edge on GreenLake. That's going to be uh, data analytics on GreenLake. They're partnering with companies like Splunk um, and doing services to deploy containers on GreenLake. This is sort of the direction. Uh, everything is a service by 2022, was it? It was three years. Um, so you're only talking another 14, 15 months where uh, until 2022 is here. So that was kind of my big take, Pat, on this one was they're growing in the right places overall. And by the way, what a smart move. Get out of the Silicon Valley. I know unpopular in the tech community, but the tax benefits, financial benefits, the ability to uh, deploy and employ people in a reasonable wage uh, and give them a high standard of living in Texas. Um, you know, this isn't becoming more popular by accident. This is a true challenge that the Valley is going to have to answer to, especially with remote work um, and just the overall. So not to get too political here, but I thought, and by the way, back to its roots, right? Compact days uh, of Houston. Uh, they're going back to the Wood Glens. 
which is, by the way, a really beautiful place. Uh, a lot of great facilities there. And I think it'll be a good move for HP. I like seeing uh, tech being diversified across our country. That's good stuff, Daniel. And uh, yeah, it, it, you know, this move from Silicon Valley uh, to other places, I, I've seen the Silicon Valley take on it, which is, hey, good riddance, right? Good, good luck uh, out there. But, but I think that uh, many companies are just like you said, they're seeing the benefits of not being, not being headquartered there. They're going to have a lot of employees there, right? And, and for certain types of jobs, uh, you do want to recruit from Silicon Valley. Uh, and others, you, you just, there's not necessarily an incremental benefit uh, from it. So it is nice to, to see HPE coming to uh, Texas. And I think the governor has done a, a really good job uh, bringing in uh, those businesses. So uh, with that, uh, we went a little bit long today. I really appreciate you hanging with us uh, for uh, Daniel Newman and Patrick Moorhead and the 65 Live TV. We appreciate you. Thank you. Press that subscribe button and have a great week.